Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue uh, more or less in the same topic that Lenny was talking about. So he gave the more mathematically precise part of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll give the... Yeah, we'll get some pictures. Uh, I'm not sure if they're nice, but um, yeah. So I'll, I'll give some ideas on how uh, this this is this could work. It will be more speculative. Um, but let me start with some generalities. So we have these two descriptions of black holes: one from infinity, where we know through ADS-CFT and so on, we know what the microstates are, and we have on the other hand, the description from the falling observer. And I think we should not give up on any of the two. We should uh, make them consistent, and that's uh, the challenge. And uh, it would probably require all the ideas that are being discussed. I mean, there are many proposals, and probably all of them will be important for, uh, for understanding how to make them consistent. I mean, in general, when we had problems with dualities, it was not that uh, the duality was wrong, typically, but it was that our understanding of the duality was wrong. Or, um, so, um, that's, uh, I mean, the question is whether gravity results from, the, from some approximation, and perhaps uh, this approximation sacrifices unitarity. And there is one historical example, which is, I think, very similar to what we have here, which is the Boltzmann equation. So, it's an equation which apparently uh, describes uh, what's going on in a in a gas, and uh, it's irreversible, and entropy increases. Um, and so that's the, the H theorem. And um, microscopic, so H, H is for horizon that the area increases. Sorry. And microscopic, uh, mi microscopically, we have time reversibility. And this historically led to uh, some paradoxes. And there's, it has a famous name, Lockschmidt paradox, uh, the idea that uh, these two that Descriptions seem to be incompatible, but we now understand uh, better where we're putting in the time irreversibility when we put in the statistical description. Um, and, and well, so we should probably, our, our situation here is somewhat similar to this. And um, um, recall that uh, hydrodynamics works well for black holes. So this is a particular case of, uh, I mean, we have from the boundary description, it's, it looks like gravity should be like uh, the Boltzmann equation, perhaps. Or, um, or something similar. It should be the quantum Boltzmann equation for strongly interacting systems. And if we understand this properly, maybe we'll find this phenomenon of interior even in other more ordinary system, uh, whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> in some sense, this black hole problem is similar to other mesoscopic physics problems, because we have both the statistical mechanics description and deterministic. But the new feature is the presence of a pure state, this pure state inside the horizon. Um, okay, so we have understood various features of the emergence of space-time uh, from the gauge theory, um, and some of these features are similar to uh, what's understood through the renormalization group flow. Um, and so, in particular, uh, we have if we have the ground state of field theories, so empty ADS, for example, um, we have the usual Wilson and renormalization group uh, picture and that different radial directions correspond to different scales in the field theory. And that's uh, fairly well understood. Now, I would like to review some, uh, some things that uh, condensed matter theories did to understand a little better this uh, Wilsonian description of uh, the ground, ground states. And I think uh, because they have, they have a lot of similarity to how the geometry emerges, um, and I'll discuss some of the similarities. This goes by the name of tensor networks. Uh, and the simplest example is uh, if you consider a spin chain. So we have spins plus or minus a half. Um, and there is some Hamiltonian. And we're trying to describe the, uh, the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And so we can. So the objective is to find the wave function as a function of all the spins. Um, and one can make an ansatz for the wave function that in terms of uh, a trace of a bunch of tensors, n tensors. These are d times d 
dimensional matrices, and for each for each side we have two such matrices corresponding to the spin plus a half or minus a half, and we contract we take the product, so we contract all the indices of these tensors, and we'll get the we'll get the number that will depend on all the spins. Okay. So that's uh, that's one possibility. The tensors could be all different, or they could all be the same. So all for all sides, we could have the same two tensors, for example. So if the system is translation invariant, then uh, we'll have the same tensor for all of them. We expect to have a wave function, which is translation invariant, the same tensor everywhere. And that uh, gives us a wave function. So it's a way of constructing a particular wave function. And what is found is that this representation works pretty well. It describes well ground states of uh, systems uh, if the system has a mass gap. So, um, it describes well wave functions where uh, the entanglement entropy, um, it basically the important property is that the entanglement entropy is uh, finite. So if you divide the system into two, you have a finite uh, amount of entanglement between the two si sides. And uh, as long as the dimension, as, as the dimension of the tensors or the number of indices is big enough, uh, one gets a good accurate description. And people have done this numerically and they've uh, understood that they managed to uh, get very nice results using these methods. Um, notice, notice that uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space of this system is 2 to the L. L is the number of spins that we have in, the, in this closed chain. Um, the dimension of the space of tensors is uh, L times uh, D squared. right? Um, so that's the number of uh, parameters we have in this uh, ansatz for the wave function. And so we're exploring a subspace of the uh, of the Hilbert space of the. It's not. Um, this is some particular subspace of the Hilbert space of um, of this of the original system. Now, of course, um, here we constructed the particular wave function. Um, we could, for example, change the tensors, and as we change the tensor, we we span various wave functions. And then we can take linear combinations of those wave functions. And if we start now taking linear combinations of those wave functions written in that particular way, uh, we have the superposition of those tensor networks. And that would be something of much higher dimension. Um, and that's bigger than the original dimension. So there is some redundancy in this description. So you could either, um, so you are representing superpositions in terms of enlarging the, um, the amount of indices in the tensor. Okay. Um, so in such a way that you consider just that one single wave function written in this way. Now that was done for. Um, I'm just, I'm sorry, can you say one more time about the tensors? Yeah. So the, the tensors. So for for a given problem. So imagine you had a particular uh, spin chain, uh, and you are studying the ground state. Then you would find the tensors are concrete uh, d by d dimensional matrices. You have two of them, one for spin up and one for spin down and you would find them numerically. So this is what people do. Yeah, And they are chosen in such a way that the wave function written in that particular wave is the ground state of your particular Hamiltonian. It's annihilated by Hamiltonian. Right? So it's a representation of the wave function uh, in terms of uh, these particular tensors. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, this is very important. Yeah. If, if, no, no, you, 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 you might not know, uh, and you might, people solve numerically for these ground states. It's a variational it's a variation ansatz, yeah. Yeah, so that, that is known, that, that is, um, that will work. That will not work for all systems. That will work as long as the entanglement entropy is less than, is obeys this relationship. So this is the entanglement entropy when you cut the system into two pieces. If, as long as that's small, then, uh, compared to the dimension of the, the tensors, then it would work. So should the entanglement just be proportional to L? No, 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 no. If S entanglement is proportional to L, then it won't work. Then you get no, no, then, then, it, then it won't work. So S entanglement, oh, yeah, sorry. S entanglement is a property of the system you want to describe, OK? It's fixed. Forget about D, about the tensor networks. It's a physically uh, relevant thing. You calculate it, gives you a number. And then you want to give it, you want 
someone tells you, I have a system which has uh, some entanglement entropy. Find the wave function for me, right? And no, 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 it's not. No, 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 no. The point is that for this representation to work, it's not the function of L. So this will work for systems that have mass gap, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, L, L is the length of the system, so it will work for those systems. And it will not work, for, exa for example, it will not work in a system that uh, is conformal in the infrared or scale invariant in the infrared, then it w this will not work. Okay. Um, so, um, or it would work if you make d, I mean, proportional to L, but uh, increasing with L, but it's not so convenient. Okay. Um, so then, what works in the case that you have scale invariant systems is this this ansatz. Uh, it's called Mera. It's proposed. Um, by Vidal and others. Um, okay, so uh, in this in this ansatz, you have a, the tensors are a little more complicated. So the spins are here. So these are uh, where the spins. Yeah, let me let me go back to the previous story because now I'm going to. So this was the original representation. I'm, uh, we are represent we are going to represent it in the following way. So we have the the the, the lines that come in from the bottom are the spins. Okay, and each tensor will be an intersection between two lines, the line that comes in and the line that goes in this way. And this line represents an, one of the indices of the tensor, and this the other index of the tensor. And a closed line represents a contraction of the two, ten, two indices. Okay. So that's uh, the story. Um, okay, so now uh, this is similar, except that here we have a five index tensor. Okay, so let's, let's pick a bulk point here. So we have a five index tensor. Um, so, and some of the indices are contracted with the ones that are higher in the hierarchy, and some are contracted. So they are contracted in this particular pattern. Okay. Um, and uh, you should think of uh, these bottom lines as being the spins, okay? And then you, um, you have all these uh, tensors. Um, this, this figure continues to the left, and it could continue infinitely into the interior. Um, and that uh, is supposed to give a good representation for systems that are scale invariant. Okay. And so this is, some, this is similar to the geometry of ADS, where um, each uh, tensor is representing one patch of uh, size uh, radius of ADS. Um, and somehow these indices, which are contracted, are representing the uh, let's say all the sum over states that w when you do a Rindler decomposition between left and right, you are summing over many states, and that's roughly what the uh, one way to think about the index. So the index is not the, these indices and so on are all contracted, and they don't represent necessarily anything physical. There is all physical operators in the uh, original theory will be, contract, will be written in terms of contractions with these three indices in the bottom never with some index here in the middle. So the index in the indices in the middle um, correspond roughly to their change or modified by local operators in the interior, which are not uh, gauge invariant in the GR sense. Um, and so that's where the analogy is. Uh, One, where does the dimension of ADS come into that picture? The yeah, analogy? the dimension comes in the pattern. So this, this picture uh, works for um, ADS3. So there's a one-dimensional boundary and then a higher-dimensional bulk. And if you want to do it more, it's uh, harder to draw. But you have, instead of five indices, you would need more indices, and, but okay. it can also be drawn. Yeah. Is it that works for higher I don't know whether numerical whether people did numerically. But at least intuitively, you feel that it should work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, the talk I heard this summer at Benasque said they don't know yet. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this, this was done for, for these one-dimensional cases. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to assume that something similar would work for higher dimensions. And I'm never going to draw the higher dimensional pictures. Um, OK, so um, that's that story. Um, and um, then there, there is this. Um, so if you want to compute the entanglement between uh, so let's say we have this region in the boundary, and you want to compute the entanglement between this region and the rest. Then, uh, yeah. 
before, before I continue, if you want to comp compute the entanglement in one of these situations, the entanglement cannot be, so let's say we cut, um, we cut some number of links here, right? Uh, let, let me go back first to the, to the picture, to this one here. So here, if we cut one of these links, the entanglement entropy cannot be bigger than log d, okay? So because there are d states here, and th that's a, an actual bound for the entanglement. The actual entanglement of the system could be smaller, but it cannot be bigger than that. If these tensors are very generic and so on, then it will be of order uh, d. Um, now similarly here, um, the entanglement, so if uh, we assume that each time we cut, we get something of order, the number of indices we have. Um, then our goal would be to minimize the number of indices we cut, and that will give you a surface which roughly has this shape. Because if you go down here, for example, you are cutting all these indices, uh, but uh, these are, well, part of them are contracted here in this vertex, so there is, they are represented short range entanglement, so that should not be counted. Okay, so that, uh, and this uh, qualitatively agrees with this picture of uh, Ruth Takayanagi where you get, uh, you get to compute the, minima, the area of the minimal surface in the bulk. Um, of course here, well, I won't say more. Mm -hmm. Now you can also use this to describe, imagine you had now um, a CFT, the same, the, the tensor network is not a property of, um, of the, of the CFT, but it's a property of the state in the CFT. You're trying to uh, represent particular states in the CFT. And so in particular, you can consider a state uh, of the CFT that itself has a mass cap. So by a state that has a mass cap, I mean a state that has a short range correlation, so short range entanglement. Uh, an example of a state like this would be uh, something like the following. Imagine you have ADS. Uh, this is the boundary of ADS. And at some point in the interior, let's focus on these slides first. At some point in the interior, you have an end of the world brain. Okay? You have some brain there. You, ADS does not continue forever, but you have some brain. And if you let, if you let this brain evolve, then it will fall and uh, it, will, it will fall in and it will create a horizon and you'll have something which from the outside looks very much like a black hole um, that form from a pure state. So let's uh, look at this. Um, at the state, at the tensor network that would represent such a state. Well, near the UV would be the same as one of these scale invariant networks, and in the infrared it will be similar to uh, the type of networks we got for a mass cap, right? for theories with a mass cap. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this is this direction is the direction of space, right? I'm not representing time. I am not. Uh, talking about time. This is a representation of the state at some particular time. Okay. Um, and in a situation like this, one can, one can actually make it this extremely precise and say exactly what, uh, what state it is in the boundary theory and so on. And well, that, that boundary state, that, that state uh, corresponds to a boundary state in the sense of d-brains and so on. And um, uh, we'll have this particular representation. So the idea is that um, if we want to recover bulk effective field theory, as, well, I mean, this is, a, again, a cartoon. Uh, the idea is that we would start with a given tensor network that represents the particular state that we have. That will be what we will call the ground state of the effective field theory. So in effective field theory, we need to start with a particular state, and then we describe small fluctuations around that particular state. And so the idea is that we start uh, with a given tensor network, and that would correspond to the bulk vacuum, or the bulk state from which we are going to build our perturbation theory. And then uh, we would find new states, which are small deformations of the tensor. So we have all these tensors all contracted. I wrote them here in a linear fashion, but as you saw, the contraction pattern could be a little more complicated. But you locally change one of these tensors a little bit, and that would be a localized uh, excitation that will be localized in the bulk. Okay? But localizing the bulk just means localizing this space of tensors and in their construction. So there is no sense in which they are necessarily localized in the boundary. Okay? Um, and this uh, local non-gauge invariant degrees of freedom that 
we normally use to describe. So normally, when we think about quantum field theory, we imagine that at each point in space there is, uh, you know, there are some spins or uh, uh, these local degrees of freedom, and uh, somehow those should correspond to these indices of the tensor. They are not observable; they are uh, not visible. What is relevant is small fluctuations of the geometry. Um, so now we go back to this uh, situation. Um, and we try to see what happens uh, when we try to time evolve this. So, so far what I discussed roughly is uh, time slice at t equal to zero. Now, in, it doesn't make a lot of sense in GR to talk about uh, time slice. I mean, if we have the wave function here, it should not correspond just to this time slice, but all the time slices that are related to it by Hamiltonian evolution. So we should, probably, we should draw a picture more like this, where we have uh, the whole, some whole causal di diamond that, uh, extends in this direction. And this was pointed out by many people, uh, most, many of them in the audience, Joe and Marov, Hermsek, etc. Um, but now what we are trying to, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll do a time evolution of this system. And I, I, the claim is that the time evolution should be well represented by a network which now will have one more step here. Now, why, why do we say this? So um, the point is that so initially we had this state with a mass gap, and now we evolve for one unit of time. By one unit, I mean one by beta, by an amount of order beta, where beta was roughly the temperature of the black hole we will end up forming, uh, or was a length scale which characterized the mass gap before. Um, and this is just simply the action of the discretized uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, will generate something with no more complexity than this. So the um, additional entanglement that it will, it will not, the, the action of the Hamiltonian by one step, it will not entangle something here with something very far away. Right? It will only entangle something with something nearby, and that can be well represented by some one, one additional line. Yeah. That looks like time evolution in the infrared. Yes, this, this is exactly time evolution. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. So time evolution in the UV, the idea is that it leaves this wave function invariant. So we're, we are thinking of these wave functions in the Schrodinger picture. So we'll have, um, we do, th this was near the UV, this was the ground state of the system. So we do time evolution and it leaves the wave function the same. It didn't change anything in the wave function. It's only the disturbance in the hole is going to propagate out. Well, the so it starts with something which, uh, so original ADS extends to the left, but we, have, we are putting a brain here in the interior uh, that cuts ADS at this position, right? Um, and that was the original diagram that I drew one slide, a couple of slides before. That was this diagram, right? Yeah, those are horizons. So Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, so outside, yeah, that's right, sorry. Yeah, this is a black hole which is uh, if we, it's closely related to the eternal black hole. The only difference with the eternal black hole is that we are putting an end-of-the-world brain here, right? So outside, the metric is the same as the metric of uh, an ordinary uh, ADS black hole or ADS black brain in this situation. Um, is that, that that's answering your question? OK, so we, we, naively from the field theory, we get this picture. And so there seems to be a stretching of, uh, a stretching of space here. So um, now, so that's in this tensor network description. Do we see anything like this in the geometry? Right? This one? Well, there are many ways of drawing them. I mean, you, you could draw them like around 45 degrees in actually in some later versions I draw them. But the, the, the basic point here is, the, is that um, you get the, there is, is the appearance of these extra horizontal lines that have the possibility of generating more and more entanglement as you uh, move. As, when, when you cut here, when you cut the system here, right? originally the entanglement was bounded by the number of lines that you were cutting. Right? And now we are having more and more lines that you can cut. Right? So the entanglement that this type of tensor network will can describe is, is uh, bigger. Okay. So 
Here? This one? Oh, this one, yeah. 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 So the pattern doesn't contribute, continue necessarily. Well, we. <clears throat> um, here there is no. So here we um, we have some kind of constant uh, number of states, uh, and we we don't expect to. Well, first of all, if if the um, if we started to have these things with five vertices, we would start contracting this network, um, and um, that would mean that um, the long distance entanglement again uh, sort of goes down, right? Uh, when we cut, uh, we will cut less and less lines. Okay. Now, we, we, yeah, we, we could put diagonals here. This this doesn't change the the structure here. So the, the, the important. Right, right. So indeed, it does appear to have this shift symmetry. Uh, well, yeah. So that, yeah. So so let me let me let me say what that essentially would be. So, um, so this. Um, well, first of all, we we have the fact that um, now it turns out that this geometry is very similar to the geometry of the nice slices of the black hole. So if you take uh, the nice slices as defined by Joe and Bob Wald, etc. Um, you find some slices that basically stay at, at the constant radial uh, radial position in the interior. So that's a particular time in the interior. And then they go out. And as time goes on on the boundary, they get longer and longer. So there, there is stretching. So this is the stretching that uh, generates the particle, the Hawking modes, that generates the information loss, etc. So this stretching is the same as the stretching that we are having here in this tensor network. So Yes, yes. This is this is time evolution, right? Time. Yeah, it's Schwarzschild time evolution. So it's evolution. yeah in the interior. Yeah, that's right. In the interior is a space evolution. In this network, it's also space evolution because we are generating a longer and longer network that we describe. We used to describe uh, states, right? And in fact, yeah. Is the Einstein equation No, the Einstein equation. So the no, this is, uh, again, that, that's why I said my, my talk was going to be a little more speculative. Uh, well, there, are no, there is no Einstein equation. This is only some pictures, uh, some an vague analogy, let's say, between this, um, this tensor network method and geometry. And I'm, I, well, on the boundary, that's the boundary. The Hamiltonian has the time translations here on the boundary, right? So we are looking at the wave function of the whole quantum gravity theory at different points in time, right? So in, in quantum gravity, the wave function in principle is independent of time. But when you have a boundary, then it does depend on time. And that's the time evolution we are using. Um, yeah, so, so without using the gravity side, this tensor picture just comes from the idea that uh, here we have some effective Hamiltonian um, that is a kind of spin chain Hamiltonian, right? Um, and and we are just evolving. So this looks like the type of complexity in the wave function that we will get by doing ordinary time evolution with that Hamiltonian. Yeah, that's the boundary Hamiltonian. So this picture, the picture here, is a picture that we uh, expect from the boundary theory. So it's it's a picture that describes uh, the type of uh, states that is a variational landsats for the wave function in the boundary theory. Some ansatz for the wave function in the boundary theory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about, let's say, the n equal to 4 theory. And so for the n equal to 4 theory, we expect a representation like this of the wave function with very high number of indices here. It's a representation that doesn't capture the full locality of ADS and so on. So, so 
I'm not answering uh, Jim's question, so there is, I don't know how Einstein equation comes in and so on. So that I, I don't know. Yeah, they are roughly ADSI, so everything for the ADSI gets lumped together in some big, big tensor. No, no, it doesn't. But this structure is supposed to happen to occur for strongly coupled field theories as well as for uh, weakly coupled ones. So in, in fact, the condensed matter people are interested precisely because it can describe strongly coupled theories. So I understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you saying that this picture will come out regardless of the Hamiltonian? Well, I mean, if you have some Hamiltonian that uh, doesn't do anything, right? So Hamiltonian h equal to zero, then you don't need to add anything here, and uh, you know you'll get something time independent. And, Everything would be fine. So this is the most complex thing that the Hamiltonian can do, right? So a, a, a complicated Hamiltonian would do this, but not something more complicated than this. Okay. So we're just going to assume that the Hamiltonian is as complicated as it could be, and so it will give us something like this. So if, if I just had a, if I just had a, um, mm -hmm. a generic hydrogen state, yes. Would that look like? I guess that would be just kind of a uh, well, there are many higher energy states. I don't know. So each, uh, I can't answer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the bottom part is the same. That's the vacuum near infinity. Yeah. And then it will differ in the interior. In the interior, it will differ. It could be. Yeah. If, if you only add a particle, let's say you add only a single particle. So that would be the formation of some ten, one of these tensors in the position where the particle is in ADS. That's uh, that's the idea. Right, this is a description of the wave function. So if you change your parameters, it will change this wave function. It will, have to, it will start uh, changing, will do some change, which as you evolve in time, will move along this, uh, this network. Right. Yeah. So I understand that the bulk high level systems, of course, going to looking for different networks like this to get the same state on the ground. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, you do you do you do bulk evolution. You now have a new wave function. I don't know how to do the evolution of the network from the point of view of the network itself, right? So here the idea is that you start at some time with one network. You go to the next time. You redraw the whole new network and you find the new uh, the new tensors. Okay. So something that is missing here that we have in gravity is some way of update, updating these tensors purely from the bulk point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So the idea here is that uh, this network describes the whole yellow region. Uh, is that obvious, or could it be that each of the blue slices corresponds to a different network that gives approximates the same state? Because if there's multiple. Yes, yes, that, that, that you, you could also, well, you, you could also think about it like that, but. The, the point of view, I'm, yes, that that could be. Um, um, yeah, that's that's possible. But in, but in, any, in any, the point that uh, from what, what we expect is that once we give the field theory wave function on the on the right at that point, we know about the whole slice. So if um, once you have let's say the wave function for one of those slices, then all the other ones should give you the same wave function. That's the statement of the bulk reparameterization symmetry. Would be the statement that with all possible networks you would get the same wave function. Yeah. The length of your night slices is sort of fixed by the yellow triangle, right? And it's more or less independent of which slices you Yeah, yeah. So here, actually, the, so the length of this blue slice, of course, if we choose a slice along the horizon, it would have length zero. Um, so if so, that that length is can be compared to the net, network as follows. So we can. Uh, maybe I'll discuss that later. Okay. Well, maybe I'll discuss it right now. So if you cut it, uh, if you cut the network here, you'll get some entanglement entropy, um, and this is a spatial direction. So I didn't draw the spatial direction here, but if we, if you cut here, you can find this Rutaganagi surface, and demanding that it's a minimal area fixes it to be roughly what I drew there. Uh, so fixes the radial position inside and gives it the non-zero length and a length that has properties which agree with this network. 
Now, if you send some particle, if you send some particle from the boundary that fell in, um, you would expect there's some kind of perturbation here of the tensor network in this point. And as time evolves, you are evolving in time, and this gets to be deeper and deeper inside the network. Right? And so you can you can think of it as um, um, so here here this was never out of causal content, so it can always send you a signal. But uh, also, um, if you think about this blue slice, well, it's something that which is inside. And, uh. So in that picture there with the green circle, is that supposed to represent? Uh, a perturbation of the tensor. So the tensor was not uh, what it was before you sent the particle. It's uh, a new tensor which represents the presence, represents the fact that the wave function has changed to a new wave function. Um, I have another question. Yes. Really, really long. Yes. No, it does affect, but there might be many ways of. Uh, yeah, we, we'll discuss long, long ones in a second. Um, but I should literally think of the, yeah. that dot as corresponding to something behind the horizon that corresponds to a whole. Yeah, it corresponds to the whole, whole history. Yeah, the whole thing, and so somehow the black dot, the, the dot should the represent dot everything. Possible. Yeah, or you can think, you can think of it as rep going inside also. Yeah. Um, now, um, now one, one way to understand why this tensor network is, uh, is reasonable to describe the field theory is to consider a simple example of a, a free field theory where you start from, uh, you construct the state in the following way. You start from a D-brain uh, in Euclidean time. You evolve for some Euclidean time, right? And then you evolve in Lorentzian time. So that's uh, something that creates uh, that geometry we was discussing before. Um, and there, when uh, on this T-brain, when you ha look at particles at equal to zero, they have some common origin here near the brain, so they are the entanglement is completely local. But as time evolves, the particles just move away from each other, and that uh, the entanglement between, let's say, this particle and then and its neighbor gets uh, distributed on a, over a bigger region. Right? So then, if the pair originated in this point, it will be contained in this region, will not contribute to the entanglement between A and the outside, and if it is one like this, it will contribute. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's uh, now you could you could start from a basis of some some kind of localized uh, unentangled state. So here, on each of these tensors, you can choose uh, particular uh, indices or or contract them with particular states, and then if you evolve that, then you continue to get this um, a structure which was similar to what we discussed before. Um, okay. Now here is uh, the story about long, uh, long network. So imagine we try to construct uh, a wave function which is in a rather generic state of this energy. So one way to do it is to evolve it for a long time and keep sending stuff, right? So what type of uh, network do we get? So we get some network where we uh, have uh, perturbations of the tensors at various locations. Um, and this is a picture which is roughly agrees with what we, we expect the interior to be for such a situation. So we expect, we expect a spatial slice through the interior to roughly be something like this. Um, so, um, so this is a way to produce a more generic state. And if you, if you keep evolving this network and you evolve it for a very long time, as we were asking, at some point, uh, you can continue doing these perturbations, but you'll get the same state, right? Uh, if you keep the total energy fixed, you, there, it's redundant. So this description is redundant in the same way that uh, when we talked about uh, the tensor description and if we talk about superposition of arbitrary superpositions of tensors, we'll get the redundant description, okay? So it's uh, intrinsically redundant, but it focuses on states that uh, are close to the states you actually get by time evolution. Okay. Um, now that's uh, the story for. I didn't, understand. Yeah. I didn't understand what the blue dots are. Now. The blue dots are uh, a tensor which is different than the tensor that you and would have obtained. These are representing fluctuations. These are representing. These represent particles, particles that you sent in. Yes. Particles you sent in. Oh. Let me see, I had a, no, I lost it, sorry. Here. So you send in an extra particle. Okay. Um, and it mm -hmm. changes the tensor at this position. Right. right. 
I can do exactly the same thing. How, how am I doing with time? Oh, I'm over time. So you can do exactly the same thing uh, with uh, with a two-sided black hole. It's exactly the same story. Um, again, um, you have uh, you have similar contraction of tensors. Um, so I won't repeat the whole story. Now, when when we when, this is this would be the the black hole at equal to zero. Um, the eternal black hole at equal to zero, we have uh, this pattern of entanglement. I hope it's clear now. And then when we, when we time evolve it, we uh, say that it is natural that uh, this should be the network that should represent it. But we could also have said that, uh, well, we just put something here more complex with a tensor here, which has many more indices. So we could increase it this particular way. So there are many different ways of increasing it. And one of them seems to be more natural. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. That represent the, the fact that uh, the state is getting more and more entangled, right? Um, okay, so, um, okay. What is the overcompleteness again in this picture? Um, the, the overcompleteness in this, so in this picture there is no overcompleteness, so we have uh, this, com construction of tensors, and that represents one particular wave function, the wave function of the entangled black hole. Now, we could start sending in particles, and uh, you're trying to modify it, right? Um, and that would amount to modifying each of these tensors. So that's that's analogous to putting particles in the interior of the black hole. Um, and that would modify it, and it could modify it in an overcomplete way. Uh, right. um, but given one particular state, when you go to the next state, it's natural to put this extra. I mean, this seems to be the type of upper. I mean, wh why am I? So, I'm pointing this out because there is a large similarity between these pictures and the uh, gravity description. The, yeah, 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 it is, it is related. Yeah. No, no, well, let's say in an eternal ADS black hole, you could, uh, what? You're not, you're not, ah, you're not. Ah, I should, I should shut up, I should hurry, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, yeah, let me, let me, um, I said that, okay, it was supposed to be 40 minutes. Well, they told me, they told me the rule was the blackboard also, and I, I, I was even sent an email that it was behind the horizon. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so um, now I was going now to discuss, go back to ER equal to EPR, um, and, um, and discuss it. We'll discuss some questions that arose, and also some, um, also in light of what I was saying right now. Um, so, well, these are things we. So the idea, well, these are uh, things we already said. But the philosophy is that the geometry is a way to codify or generate the entanglement between the two systems. So, as um, as the black hole forms, you have, oh, sorry, as you consider the eternal black hole. You have the two horizons which are touching each other. You have this very localized entanglement. And now, as time evolves, the two horizons separate from each other. Um, and there is a whole interior geometry. So interior geometry is something that exists between the two horizons. So one important thing is that the interior is not the same as the left side or the right side. So in many of the discussions, I think there is a kind of confusion between the left side and the interior. So if, if you consider the right side as the actual black hole you're interested in, um, then um, then one should not confuse the future interior with the left exterior. Okay. So, and when we say ER is equal to EPR, so the ER is uh, this, well, it could be this bridge here, but also uh, this region here in the interior, uh, whose only job is to generate the entanglement, the right pattern of entanglement between the left modes and the right modes. But it, it is incorrect 
it would be incorrect to say that this region is either this or is that, right? So we're not going to say that the interior is the same as the left or the same as radiation. So when we have radiation, radiation is the left exterior. It's not the interior, OK? Now, by doing complex operations, we can shrink, we can shrink this. So shrinking this is uh, changing the entanglement pattern to get, to get close to the uh, qubits that are on the other side. Um, OK? Yeah, so let's, yeah, so the idea is that, the, yeah. So the, the region in between was this whole region, right? So here we have the left would be this bottom part. Then we have this whole region in the middle. Uh, that's the region here, OK? Um, presumably, yes. Uh, so. Um, um, one thing I think it's, it's what you can see, before talking about the Hawking particles, let me uh, ask a question which is closely related, which is the entanglement between the modes behind, outside the horizon and inside the horizon. And that, I think, is uh, essentially the, um, so if you cut along one of these lines, let's say you cut along here, right? So there is this index. So the fact that you open this index, right, that gives you some entanglement between uh, some degrees of freedom, and it seems to be a lot, but it's between these localized degrees of freedom, which are not obviously physical. Um, they become physical through in Hawking radiation situation, but they are not obviously physical in the GR sense. Uh, and this, these pictures have also this, this property. That, um, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not claiming this is the field theory description of the interior. I'm just saying this is similar. It's some vaguely similar. Uh, and ho hopefully, there will be some. There is no time here. There's no clear, clear time direction, and that that is something that is missing from these pictures. And but also, I've changed in one of the middle yes. centers when you visible to. Uh, yeah, it changes. Yeah, it changes the wave function and it changes the pattern of entanglement. But the operator, what is an op so an operator here is something that changes one of these tensors. It's the operator of the effective field theory changes the tensor. Doesn't have a very direct translation to uh, the operators in the boundary. So when we try to answer questions like um, is A commutator with EC equal to zero or not, we have to uh, keep in mind that uh, the space where these operators are acting, the bulk operators, is, are these tensors. These operators are not um, defined on the on the boundary itself. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, we, we don't have the local, uh, I mean, we don't have the structure that we have in the Wheeler DeWitt equation. We don't have a Wheeler DeWitt equation or something similar. Um, we don't have, let me say it in a different way. So we don't have, look, uh, clear locality in the bulk. This is locality within an ADS radius. Uh, so, uh, but no, notice that the interior extends over many, many ADS radius, because radii. So this is a rough description and not, yeah. Um. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So, so for example, if um, um, in, a, in a situation like this, if you want to compute the entanglement entropy between for a region that uh, is, let's say, this size, well, it might be more convenient to consider a surface like this, right? So once you start having this square pattern, it's not convenient to take the surface and make it bigger in the interior. So that's uh, how you can get this volume. Um, OK. Well, these are uh, some remarks I wanted to make. Uh, what? Uh, well, some of these I already made. Um, now, notice that uh, to describe the interior is not enough. Um, I mean, well, one thing is clear is one black hole is not enough. We need both black holes. This was made by many people. 
And one other point is that this is not equal to saying that A is equal to RB. So saying A equal to RB is the same as saying that the left interior, the left exterior is the same as the interior. We're not saying this. Um, what we are saying is less clear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are you denying but, that if, if more than half the radiation has come out, that A can be pretty well approximated by RB? Uh, yes. So, yes, yes. Yeah, so so what, I, what I'm denying is the following. RB is the same as the left exterior, right? So we should not consider this, uh, this region here as equal to the left exterior, OK? Now, for example, so there is this operator people normally call A, or some people call A, which is called, the, it lives in here, right? Now, if we say this A acts on the, it's the same as some left exterior operator, right? Which, in some sense, approximately, you might think about it that, that way. But it's not correct to think about it precisely this way. And one reason is the following. Imagine that there is some guy that falls in through here and acts with the A, OK? He goes in, and some guy that falls in, and then uh, acts with this operator. Then he would be able to, if that operator was an operator that lived here, he would be able to send a signal outside. And that, that's already in this case. I, I don't need to consider more complicated cases. Even in this case, he cannot send a signal uh, to the outside. Right? It, it would be forbidden by causality. If this interpretation is correct, that having two uh, entangled black holes, uh, well, that this describes two entangled black holes that are very far from each other, by falling into one black hole, by s sending something into one black hole, whatever you would send, you cannot send a signal to, to the guy who is outside the other black hole. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. B, B is maximally entangled with A. B, yeah. Right, but B can be maximally entangled, almost maximally entangled, with something strictly on the left side. Yes. That, that's yes. possible. So. That is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I mean, in this picture, I guess the idea, of, so, so by comparing it to these tensile networks, the, the, what I'm trying to say is that this whole interior region seems to arise simply from trying to approximate better the state. It's some, something that gives us a good approximation to the state for more, most questions. Um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so th this is, again, something I don't have anything to say about. Yeah, I don't know. Because we don't have, we, th this picture of the networks are good for distances bigger than the radius of ADS, right? So intrinsically, uh, by the, the way we understand them today. Um, and this is a distance comparable to the radius of ADS. So proper time to the singularity is comparable to the, to the radius of ADS. So to answer this question, one would have to build something similar to these networks, but. Uh, I mean, this, this business with the networks I'm talking about is similar to other pictures people have discussed of causal diamonds, uh, et cetera. Um, but Why doesn't that large time step make you worried about the significance of anything that you've said for the interior? Yeah, that, that makes me worried. But uh, I, the, the only evidence that we are doing something related to the interior is the fact that the entanglement entropy agrees with uh, what is computed by the root Takayanagi formula, which actually senses the interior directly. So, um, but yeah, you could say, well, this doesn't make any sense or whatever. But uh, I think I think it's in some right direction. The the proper thing. It's not. We we don't know what it is, but. Uh. We're talking about it doesn't right? I mean, the extremal yes. surfaces don't go inside. Yeah, th that, that's when you consider a spatial section uh, outside. Yeah. But if you were to. Um, yeah, if you consider time-dependent uh, situations, for example, the root Akainai surface can go uh, into But then the it's not a killing horizon, and the horizon is somehow. Um, right. Well, I mean, one, one concrete uh, situation is the one I was uh, discussing of the brain that falls behind the horizon. The geometry is exactly the same as the geometry of the ordinary eternal black hole. Um, but nevertheless, this uh, geodesics can do this. Um, OK, let, let me give you a better example, perhaps more clear. So. You can consider an eternal black hole like this, but with a, an infinite spatial direction, 
right? And now you can divide your two systems into what's uh, in front of the screen and what's behind of the screen, right? This is, uh, these are the two sub subsystems. And then in that situation, the uh, root Akanai surface will go from one side to the other, uh, crossing the horizon. And then you evolve, and then you have these uh, surfaces I was drawing before. I perhaps should have emphasized that. Uh, so this surface is one of those root Akanai surfaces that is cutting the system into two parts. We needed this extra spatial slice to make this more clear. Uh, okay. Mm. Right. Well, this point I've already uh, made, that A cannot be an operator on the left side. So. Um. Now let me discuss a couple of uh, questions that were discussed before. Uh, I guess I should probably finish them. Maybe this will be discussed in Stanford talk, so I won't discuss it. One point is that um, not all entangled states, or even entangled states of black holes, have a smooth geometry. And this was pointed out in uh, this paper, and was also pointed out to us by these people. And the reason is kind of fun, so I'll so if you consider uh, such an entangled state of three very, uh, four very separated black holes, um, this is called the GHC state, for those who know what that is, um, then, uh, then you can form uh, a particular combination, which is called something like triple mutual information, that in all cases where it's the entropy is given by Ruta Kayanagi is always less than zero. Um, uh, this was shown in a paper by Hayden Maloney and someone else. Um, and Hedrick. Um, and so in that situation, there cannot be a bridge like this connecting all uh, four black holes that is smooth. So in this case, the bridgeness, even though the black holes are microscopic, the bridge necessarily has to be quantum mechanical. Um, but well, of course, this is a very special state. Um, and but yeah, so. Um, well, these are various uh, statements. So I now come various statements about uh, looking at the eternal black hole in different ways um, and understanding what it means to, to have this bridge. So one was uh, at equal to zero, we have this uh, region connecting the two. At uh, bigger times, we have this other region. And the regions, these two regions are different. So different entangled states give you different space times in the interior, Okay, different combinations of tensors in the tensor network or here, different space times. Um, even though the space times are different, in some cases, the, uh, so these regions might be common to various space times. The same story with the tensor networks. You might generate complicated entanglement by changing something deep inside, but uh, the tensors in some region could be the same. Um, now here, this is uh, one fun example. So. Imagine you, um, you take, in quantum field theory, you can consider um, the entangled state that describes uh, the Minkowski vacuum in Rindler coordinates. And, and then uh, you make a unitary transformation that all it does is it adds this little phase uh, factor for each of the modes. Right? So this is a state that, because you added this uh, phase, this little phase factor, uh, becomes uh, singular. It's a state that creates. Uh, Singular, contains a singularity here, and it will be singular on Lycon, et cetera. So just this little phase, this little change, uh, would make this state singular. Now, this state um, would be non-singular and would actually be equal to the Minkowski vacuum if we were to view it as a state quantized along this slice. So if we view it as uh, a state that's not quantized along this special slice, but quantized along this other slice, then it would be perfectly non-singular. Okay. Um, OK, but if we are in Minkowski space, uh, we have to say on which slice we're quantizing. And once we give the slice and we change the phase, then we have a problem. Now imagine uh, now we go to the black hole case. And we have the standard um, eternal black hole state uh, that's supposed to describe this region. And now we add uh, these phases. Okay. So we, we have a given state, and we add some phases. Uh, naively, if, if it was the same as in quantum field theory, uh, we would conclude it's singular. But uh, the way this works is it's not the same. So adding these phases, um, 
is the same as um, would be the same as evolving this left side, and we would automatically have this. Or equivalently, it's the same as uh, considering yeah, well, it's the same as considering this other uh, geometry. So geometry inside adjusts automatically to be whatever it needs to be in order to be uh, non-singular. Well, in this, so, so no, I, I stretch it too much. Sorry. <laughs> the mm. so this this state and the state without the phase are um, two possible entangled states of the system. Okay. One describes uh, this geometry, and the other one describes this particular uh, interior geometry. Okay. They are different, um, and in this particular case, they are both non-singular. Okay. So a geometry which would naively have been singular, a transformation which would have naively given us something singular if we interpret it purely in the field theory point of view. In the gravity point of view, uh, it, what happens is the, the bridge changes in such a way that it's not, uh, not singular. OK. I have um, a detailed question. Just, so, yeah. Sorry. Well, I, I guess I could finish here. I made, I think, most of the comments I wanted to make. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah, Daniel. Uh, can you say what was going to be on those last few slides you went through? <laughs> um, well, I don't know how, how to get other states which are not the. I mean, you get other states by adding particles to the hardly hawking vacuum. That's a simple way to get other states. Um, so. So one is not saying that uh, all entangled states have the ER bridge that E and R had. So different entangled states have different things that connect them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so the question is whether they are smooth or they are not smooth and so on. Uh, now, yeah. So in your, in your uh, gravity example, yes. you were saying that uh, when you introduced this phase shift, yes, yes. Uh, that, that you were introducing a singularity. No, in the uh, field theory, we would introduce a singularity, not in gravity. Well, sorry, I guess yeah. that was implicitly including in, in the bulk. No, 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 we don't. Yeah, no, the, the point was that we don't introduce. So if we do this transformation, so if we do this transformation, we do not introduce a singularity. That was the point. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, maybe I'll try to explain this again. Yeah, can, I, can I just ask, uh, yeah. if I take the state in the bulk that you've drawn on, the, on on that slice on the right, yeah, on the bottom right, yeah, yeah, okay, and uh, and I I use the same state but I quantize it on a horizontal slice. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, and, here. And and then yeah. then, that, there will, then there will be singular. No, no, it's still non-singular. So if you take if you take this and uh, that, that's a different slice different slice in the bulk, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can do this and quantize on some slice. I mean the slice has to end here. But uh, you can do that, and it's always non-singular. No, I want I want it to stay on a fixed horizontal slice in the bulk. In a fixed horizontal yeah. slice. Yeah, and start with yeah. a vacuum, and then introduce, then yeah. add some phases yeah. on the left, but yeah. keep it on that slice. Then I'm changing the state on that slice, right? Right. And then I'm introducing a singularity at the at, at in the middle. Yeah, no, no. Well, yeah. no, we're not. I'm not changing the slice right now. I mean, I'm just introducing a singularity. In the you see, what what happens is that when you ch when you ch when you do this change, it's the same as changing the gluing that the exists between the left time and the right time, right, through the interior. And that's why I, I'm not yet doing the, ADS CFD. Uh, oh, I'm just in the interior. You're just in. The I'm interior. just in the interior. I'm just taking the left half of the interior and messing yeah. around with the state. Th this may be a good place to make yes, my point, yes, which may 
answer Raphael's question. I don't. I uh, yeah, think good. you may yeah. actually agree with what I'm saying. Can I, I can I first formulate the question though? I haven't I haven't gotten there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> My question is whether that singular state can be represented in the, in the, in the double C of T. Because it seems like it can't, because you would always map it to a, to a non-singular state on, on a different choice of slices. Well, I don't know whether it can be represented. It's not something simple like this. So it's not just putting a face in here. I, I don't know how to represent it. Presumably, something close to that singular state can be represented, but it's not. I don't see an easy way to do to, to say what it is in the CFD language. Uh, maybe it can be constructed. I don't know. It's not something as clear as it. So the point here was to show that uh, some very particular states that naively would be singular from a field theory point of view are, uh, are not singular in this context. So, so you don't really mean that change, right? I mean, because this is where these are the end. Actually, let me, because I have the microphone, yeah, let yeah, me intervene. Yeah, ahead, this is yeah. the point I wanted to address, just to yeah, clarify yeah, yeah, yeah. for us and for, the, I think, everyone, yeah. that as I understand it, the left side of those two lines represent different operations, even in the bulk semi-classical limit. The left, the yes. bottom one yes. is acting with the boundary Hamiltonian. Yes. The one on top is acting with eh, the, the integral of the matter is stress tensor against some you know, vector field from the horizon outward. Yes. And if you use semi-classical bulk gravity to relate the two, mm -hmm. they're not equal. The gravitational yes. Gauss's law relates the top one to the bottom one plus a boundary term on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And that boundary term on the horizon is does Roughly speaking, what it does is it makes the kink you have on the left side. Mm -hmm. So the left, the bottom line prescription in semi-classical gravity does exactly, if you like, take the top, tilt it, and quote, quantize it along the kinked surface. They, they're not separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if you do a, a generic unitary transformation, maybe you need to use similar words. Right? So this is a particular, so you say, so in, in uh, your in your paper with AMS, you said, if I do a unitary transformation on uh, some of these states yeah. uh, on, on the left side, some arbitrary unitary transformation, um, I will generate a singularity. But maybe not. Maybe what happens is that uh, you generate a new bulk. Since you're talking to me, yeah. we didn't say quite those words. Well, we, we said if you did certain unitary transformations, you would generate excited states, which mm -hmm. do still have semi-classical inscriptions. They're just excited. OK. Yeah. So I, I have no, no, no complaint again. I guess it could just be a different connection between the left side and the right side. Although we didn't claim that those excited states were generic. Yeah. Have you thought at all about um, the tensor network description of a typical state? Um, yeah, so I think I think what's important is what, what it is. What So you can take a typical state um, and it could be that the typical state has different con different construction, and one construction could be the one that uh, I discussed. So I think it will be probably something like uh, let me see. This is a way to generate typical states. I think it would be something like this. So a very long uh, network with uh, changes at various locations. Maybe sort of said what I was trying to say, but just I, I think you don't really mean the kink, right? Like when you do ADM, so if you just do some phase rotations, then you should you're moving one of those boundary points up without the other one, but I think you should just still connect them by some sort of smooth geometry, and then there's no boundary term uh, that's generated. Um, and, and I mean, and that's fine. I mean, that still is enough to tell you that if you put in these phase rotations, that that you get a state where the geometry is still smooth. Yeah, the geometry is smooth. The geometry is the yellow. Piece. I mean, it's just a piece. Yeah, of yeah. The, the kink. Is, yeah, the yellow region is the only important thing. The kink is just a distraction, I think. Yeah. Well, the, the kink was drawn there to. Um, well, okay. If it distracts you, it's just the, it's just that it is similar. So this state is smooth, and if I were to quantize here on these slices the state that I would get uh, this field theory problem for which the uh, correct uh, Minkowski description is this particular state. So yeah, that, that's all. Yeah, I mean, it's clear from the picture that it's not. I mean, the, 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 this was drawn simply to 
make the point that uh, this is how the state looks like when quantized on those particular slices. Yeah. I don't really understand. If um, the yellow regions are described by Wheeler DeWitt type yes. uh, wave functions, then what exactly does a kink mean? A kink means that there's some extrinsic curvature at the, uh, at the kink. Is that right? Uh, no. this extrinsic curvature in the, in the sense that. Uh, it, it, just for the description, I just chose a funny slice. To no, I, I know. I, but I know what you did. Yeah. But if I want to ask, <laughs> a Wheeler DeWitt wave function contains every possible geometry that you could have uh, right. that you, uh, in there. Right, right, exactly. Uh, right, it contains all the geometries. Yeah. And to say that a geometry has a kink in it, I think is a statement about the derivatives of the metric in the perpendicular direction to the, uh, it's a statement about yeah. the curvature of the, of the slice. Yeah. Yeah, right. The curvature of the slice is, um, is, has to do with uh, time derivatives, which means um, uh, canonical momenta. Yeah. But if you write down what the wave function is, mm -hmm. it just contains all such slices with all kinds yeah. of kinks yeah, yeah, in yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't understand. Yeah, right, I'm not. What? Yeah, no, I, I'm, right. uh, Presumably, another way of stating that is uh, to choose the slice with the kink or another slice, they're just gauge equivalent, right? You can the evolution operator that takes you from this slice to one that's smooth is a gauge transformation. Oh. I mean, the, 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 the intent of this was to, to show how the effect of a unitary transformation could be something simple. Now, this, this example perhaps is too trivial, and uh, I think that's what uh, Don was hinting at. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not giving you an example of more non-trivial example. So a more non-trivial example would be one in which we do a more generic unitary transformation and what that would do is it would, so let's think about the more generic unitary transformation in the context of this tensor network, for example. So there we would need to make a longer network. So it would, maybe there is still a, some network which is longer and nothing, and every site in the network is very close to what uh, we would have for, the, let's say, the, the vacuum. And yeah. Do, do uh, you see any, um, just going back a little bit to the tensor yeah. networks, um, do you see any evidence for some connection between this redundancy in the tensor network description and the redundancy in your choice of uh, slicing in the yellow region? Is that possible? Well, the, the, the only thing is uh, well, what Aaron already said, that the, you, you can choose different networks um, and that give you the same wave function. So indeed, the tensor network discussion has uh, this redundancy built in, in it. Yeah. But I don't know how to translate them more directly. It would be nicer to give a... Well, I, I, we can discuss in private. There is one example where there is something close to this. So, slices, but I'll discuss. Uh, it seems like there's a close connection between these tensor networks and uh, lattice quantum field theories. Like, I'm trying to figure out this connection. So if I started, for example, with a lattice Euclidean quantum field theory, where the degrees of freedom happen to be labeled on the edges of my lattice instead of the vertices, then am I right that that is a tensor network? No, you, you are integrating over those degrees of freedom. So here in the tensor network. Well, um, in, a, in a quantum field theory, you also sum over histories, which is the same as uh, uh, it would be the tensors would give you the amplitudes for any set of edges to meet at a node. So I think it just, it, I think, I think a Euclidean quant lattice quantum field theory with fields on the edges just is a tensor network. Yes. And that I guess the most general tensor network is like that, except the amplitudes can be complex instead of just real. Unless I'm not thinking about that right. But to, that means there's a close connection with things other people are doing uh, in quantum field theory. So. Why don't we move that to uh, private discussion? We're, we're now into cookie time.